Hello everyone and welcome to Galaxy 89 Cars. Now in the recent year I've driven quite a few hybrid cars, mostly from Lexus, the NX300 Hybrid, the RX450 Hybrid and of course the LC500 Hybrid. These can all have a kind of fully electric element to them but of course they're fundamentally hybrid vehicles. So until today I've never actually driven a full electric car but of course that's changed now because I've been given the Tesla Model X P100D from EV Hire. Uh, you can find all of the contact details for them in the description because of course this car can be hired in the UK and Europe. So this is my first taste of a truly electric vehicle and what I want to do is kind of give you a general overview of the car and maybe also a taste of what it's like to use kind of more practically. So first of all, if we move over to the car, I want to look at kind of the exterior design very quickly and some of the key features. So this kind of follows on from the Model S and in, in a lot of ways, it's basically just a Model S but raised up. It has a lot of the uh, same kind of design elements, it's very, very smooth, uh, of course, because it doesn't have um, a combustion engine, it doesn't need anywhere near as much cooling. So the grille is a lot softer, a lot, um, smaller than it would be in a combustion engine car. This car has the 20 inch wheels. Of course, if you want, you can go up to 22 inch. Instead of two cameras, so just a front and rear, this has four uh, main cameras now because we have some up here as well. You can see those. And these are all for the uh, autopilot system. And it's got a huge, uh, I think it's a 12 uh, sonar array as well. Now, if we move to the key, now with most car keys, this is a pretty standard key, it's almost kind of um, Porsche in design because it kind of follows the same design motifs as the car. With most, with most keys, what you can do is you can open um, the rear boot that can come up automatically. You can also lock and unlock the doors. But with this, you can actually, of course, lock and unlock the car, but you can also open the doors as well. So there's some strips on the side here. So if we double tap those, we can bring up the Falcon doors. Now these take around 15 seconds, apparently, to go up and down. So if we tap the back of the key, the boot also comes up as well. Um, I'll get to storage capacity in a little bit. So at the rear, we have venting on the side and we can also adjust individual doors with the button here. And of course, at the end of the central column, there's more venting and there's also two USB sockets. And is there any type of storage space? Yes, there is. We've got dual cup holders back here as well, and they push in quite nicely. Now, the interior has actually been criticised quite a bit, and to be honest, I can kind of see why, but also at the same time, I'm quite impressed um, with what Elon and the guys at Tesla have tried to achieve. Now, if we actually get into the rear, we can see how much space we've got. And this is with the seat back. If we look down, there's actually quite a significant amount of space. Um, of course, these can be moved back and forward with that. Now, a thing that can also be done with the key, as we've got everything up, is bring it down. But before I do that, let's go into the rear to have a quick look at some of the storage space. Now, because this is the uh, six seat model, you can get seven, you can have a central seat goes in the, in the middle there. Um, these rear seats here can be folded down completely. And of course you can go in here as well, I imagine. There we go. <laughs> and you have all the charging cables and different things down there. Um, with that down, and if, if you've piled them on top, this is kind of the main rear boot area. Now, if you fold the rear seats down and take that area away as well, you have over 2,000 litres of storage space. Um, but of course, because this isn't a combustion engine car, you also have a boot space at the front, which is also known as a frunk. Now, to open this, once again, it's all integrated. You just have to uh, double tap on the front of the key, and then this area opens up as well. Uh, so it's kind of like, if we're going to compare it to a uh, combustion engine car, it's kind of like a uh, like my Boxster, for example, a rear mid-mounted uh, setup, because that way it's got the front and the back storage. Now, this is actually fairly deep. Um, we've got the Tesla kit in the front. It's quite a large area and the figures off the top of my head I think this is 186 litres of storage capacity. To open the front doors you just have to depress there and it will open to you which is really really nice. Um, and to close them you just go here and pull the handle and the door will close itself. So I'll shut this lid back down. Now this is the P100D with ludicrous mode and it's the highest specification model you can buy, at least in terms of performance. 
Um, it, it produces 611 brake horsepower, 0 to 60 with ludicrous modes, 2.9 seconds. I would like to try that, but I don't know where. It also has the uh, semi-autonomous driving function, which is, in honesty, more like a very intelligent semi-autonomous cruise control than anything else. Um, it's also uh, four-wheel drive. It's called um, dual motor four-wheel drive because the batteries which lie all along the bottom of the car, 100 kilowatt hours worth, um, there's a motor at the front and the rear. So to bring all the doors down, what we do is get the key at the top, depress three times quickly, and then everything will come down. It's got a party piece as well as this, of course, you know, if Falcon doors aren't enough, we also need the car to be able to dance as well, but we're not gonna do that today. Uh, so now we're inside. Like I said before, just give that a pull and the door will close. There's also an automatic open function when you get close to the car that you can turn off and you can uh, put back on again using all of the controls here on the panel. Um, that's been switched off because what usually happens is you walk close to the car, the car and it swings open and it hits you. In terms of the controls and everything, they've actually been taken from Mercedes. So this is the same stock that I had in the G-Wagon and the, uh, the E53 AMG that I drove recently. You also have the central screen here. That's some really interesting features that I'm gonna show you a little bit later in the video. Of course, the massive screen in the center, which is actually very um, responsive and we can zoom down. And these little red things here are all the supercharger locations. Before we go on to that, I'll show you a little bit more We've got a glove storage in there. Um, we've also got cup holders and things down here um, with a little carbon fiber lid and also this little storage area here with a little lid here too. So this can also be moved forwards and backwards. So we just slide it like that. And then you have two more cup holders. That's four cup holders in the front. And a nice feature of this is that you can take these panels out completely and just have quite a large front storage area or you can uh, just take two out and then have one cup holder or uh, just leave them and have four cup holders. I have actually got to go to uh, Alpine today. I'm filming with a new, or Alpine, I've been criticised for saying that incorrectly. So one thing I want to do is navigate. So it's very easy to do that in this car. And then we go here top one and we can navigate it does it very very quickly what it will do is if we need to supercharge at any point if we need to charge up it will schedule that in automatically now with the screen here it also comes onto the screen right now I think it's time to start the journey but before we do that this is my only real chance to check out some actual kind of economy information so I don't know if you can see here, I might have to zoom in a little bit, but we have 98 miles of charge remaining. Now the journey I have to do today, 32 miles, 53 minutes. And it also says that I'll get there and I have 24% charge remaining. Now it may be a bit risky in all honesty, but I'm gonna get there with 24% and then all I have to do is drive to the Heathrow uh, supercharger. So 32 mile journey, 98 miles of range. I'm going to update you and show you exactly how much charge is left at that point. Before setting off on my journey, I think I'm gonna show you kind of how to set the car up a bit. Now you can adjust the seats using the controls here. So we go to controls, then seats. You can move the seats back and forward just with the control panel here, which is a pretty cool feature. But the actual proper seat controls are down by the side where my, where my hand is here. And you can kind of see it very Mercedes like tilting back and forward. So once you get yourself into a good seating position, we can adjust the mirrors. All the mirror controls are down here. That's really simple to use. I'm pretty sure these are from Mercedes as well. You just click on the mirror you want and then press the buttons to adjust up and down and side to side. Uh, you can also fold them in as well. Um, the mirror, there's not actually a huge amount of visibility out of the back, but it's a really nice mirror component. Once again, a seamless piece. Um, I think it's auto dimming as well. So I'm using Waze because I like to use Waze. It's just easier. Um, but of course, I've just shown you how to do all of the sat nav. That's very easy in this car. It's a lot easier than a lot of other cars. You don't have any sort of unnecessary extra equipment. It's just touchscreen. It's what we know. Um, to set the car off, literally all you do is go down and then the car is into drive. Uh, and then that's it. Right, so I've just arrived at West London Renault, um, as you can kind of see over there, I think. 
Uh, what I wanted to show you is kind of how uh, economical this car is. Now, I don't know if you remember, but we had around 98 miles predicted range remaining when we set off. Now, it was around a 35 mile journey. So as you can see, we've actually done very well. Yesterday when I was driving kind of more um, in the kind of smaller countryside roads, the charge efficiency was less efficient. So the battery charge was actually declining quite significantly quicker than the range that we're actually covering. But here we've actually done pretty well. So that is actually something I'm actually quite impressed with. So I've just finished filming with the new Alpine A110 Legend. Uh, it's got quite a few interesting differences. Um, it's maybe a bit weird that I'm doing another EV hire video at Renault West London. Um, but I just wanted to show you, I think maybe also in the exact same parking spot I was in last time, how the Model X kind of fits into a normal, regular UK parking space. Because in some ways this car is more built, might be more suited for the American market. I mean, it's over five meters long pretty much two meters wide it's a very big vehicle you can see in comparison to like the vans you've got either side I mean, of course it's not that much it's 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 smaller it's shorter it's not exactly that much uh, slimmer really got a bit of overhang at the rear and at the front as well because of the sort of bumpers extended a little bit we've got a bit of overhang at the rear as well in terms of getting into the space it was really easy because it's got a really good uh, parking sensor system that I'll show you and also uh, of course the rear view camera. For the next part of this video what I want to do is test out one really how easy it is to navigate to a supercharger using the car's uh, navigation system but then also how easy it is to park and navigate in a uh, supercharger space and also start charging the car. Now remember I've never done any of this before of course I've navigated and I've used navigation but I've never used a charger I've never used a supercharger or electric car charger of any kind whatsoever so I'm interested to see what the experience is going to be like. Um, after that it's just going to be a drive back to EV hire and in that time I think I'm going to reflect a little bit on things I've kind of learned about the car but before that I need to navigate to uh, the nearest supercharger so right now I'm just outside of central London so wait for this to load up so I think the one I'm going to use is actually by Heathrow Airport I've been told that's a good one to use obviously like I've just said and I've just shown this is quite a large car so I don't necessarily want to go into a shopping center um, so where is it going to be is it this one Heathrow UK Terminal 5. I think it might be that one. So what we can see is that there are eight stalls available in total, two currently in use, six available, which is good, and we just have to navigate to there from here. And let's see how quick that takes. So just processing, very easy. And of course, we get all the information put into there as well. Okay, so I'm ready to go to charge this car up. But what I want to show you is the reversing camera. So we go here and we press up to go into reverse. And then we have the top screen, which shows the reversing camera. These white lines aren't actually the parking lines. They're the guidance lines that turn with the steering wheel. And then we have this really um, innovative sort of motion sensor. Of course, this car has loads of um, sensor routes. We can see it moving down there with the traffic that's driving past. And it kind of shows you like more of a fluid process of um, the obstacles around you. So I've reached my destination and I have backed up to the supercharger. Um, this is, like I said, the very first time I've done this before. I'm pretty sure it goes in here, but we don't actually need to touch that. So what we do is we literally just pull this out, I think. Um, and then apparently what we have to do is there's a button on top of the charge connector here. We just push it up here and then press this. Oh, and then that opens up. And then there's a little glowing light there. And then what we just have to do is literally just push it in and it locks. Um, and I think that's meant to go green. But apparently there was a slight issue. Now it's gone to green. So if we move inside the car, we can actually see that it gives us information about um, supercharging. So first of all, it says it down there on the screen. But then also, if we go to the main screen, we can see 52 miles. We've got a limiter on here. Um, one hour remaining, 212 miles or it's going up per hour. Um, but I'll be here for about half an hour, so I'm going to leave at 53 miles. I'm going to come back in 30 minutes and we're going to see how much it's charged in that time. Right, so it's been pretty much half an hour since I started uh, charging the Model X. We're right back to it. We can check out how much charge has been added in that time. is 
Heathrow Airport. Right, so when I left, um, we had about 53 miles. So about 25, 30 minutes later, we were up to 165 miles of charge, 166. That's not actually bad going. But what I want to do now is stop charging at the top. And we can hear it kind of uh, going down. We can unlock it there, but I think we can also go around the back. We can unlock it here as well. So, here my hand. So I think if we tap this twice, there we go. So now it's unlocked. And then oh, all we have to do is put it back up here and it's secured. And that little thing there is uh, flipped over as well. You can do that manually, but fortunately we don't actually have to do that here. And then we're uh, good to drive for another 165 miles or 170 miles. What I think I'm going to do is start off with some criticisms or some negative points I've found while using this over the last 24 hours. I'm going to start at the bottom, quite literally, with the pedals. Now, they're not necessarily difficult to push forward. I mean, the, the pedals in my Boxster are quite stiff and rigid, but in a very good way, you feel very connected to the car. But in this, the accelerator is, is it's quite high up. So, I mean, you have your foot at quite a steep angle. So you've got obviously your heel on the floor of the car and you can literally only just feel the pedal with like the very top of your foot. And I have size, I think it's 10 UK, 44 EU, something like that, shoes. Um, so, I mean, yeah, for someone with a lot smaller feet, it, unless you can move the pedal box, it might actually be quite tricky to drive this car. The driving position isn't so bad, and of course you get the huge uh, wind windscreen as well, which creates a really nice kind of atmosphere. But at the same time, the way it's so kind of low down, and you're sitting like this, it has a very kind of minivan kind of, kind of feel to it. Um, and for what is essentially a very usable performance car, I think maybe it should, you should feel like the steering wheel may, may be up here a little bit. Yes, of course, that gets in the way of the, uh, the kind of infinity dash in front of you, but I think it would probably be a lot better. The seats, and maybe it's because my, I've got the seats quite pushed forward. I like to be quite close to the wheel. Um, maybe that's the issue, but what I'm finding is that there are two things. The first is that whenever I turn the wheel to the right, more than just a little turn on the motorway, if I'm going like a proper corner, my, the back of my right arm gets stuck in the kind of lateral support of the chair. Now, it's, it's obviously a good thing for these seats. They're very, very good seats. They're very comfortable and you do feel quite hugged in them. You do feel like there's quite a lot of lateral support. So from a comfort and support and security standpoint, I personally think they're very good seats. But from a driving standpoint, from where I'm currently in my, in my personal driving position, I don't actually uh, like them very much because I, like, it just, I can't move my hand. So from a driving comfort and security standpoint, they're very good seats, at least in my opinion. But in terms of being comfortable to actually steer and use them daily, they can get a little bit annoying. Now the second thing is that they don't really have an armrest that's usable, at least for me. Now the actual armrest of the car is all the way down here. So because I'm right-handed, I usually like to have my right hand placed on the wheel. Plus I usually drive a manual, which is my daily. So my left hand is usually, not always, but it's busy, it's ready for action. In this, you have to put your arm all the way up here and partially let go of the steering wheel, which isn't so bad. But once again, I have the same problem I had in the G-Wagon is that my arm starts to go a little bit dead. Alternatively, you can kind of put your arm a little bit lower um, and then there's a gap between the kind of aluminium and, and um, carbon fiber inlaid component here and the main leather upholstered component at the top. You can kind of just put your elbow, if you've got a pointy elbow like me, you can put it in there, which is kind of okay, I suppose. Now, if we move outside briefly, this is a very large car. I'm pretty sure it's even bigger than the G63 I drove recently. And that was a very large car as well. So, you know, taking this on countryside roads, because I kind of live in the countryside, there are quite a few of those. It's quite unnerving in an honesty. You do feel the size of the vehicle. You can imagine this being more at home like this on the motorway or the freeway in America or a larger motorway in some other kind of country, like the Autobahn, for example. But when you take this through the countryside, it does feel a little tight. Moving to the infotainment system, the negatives on that, generally I have to say I'm very impressed with it. But one of the negatives, I have to say the, inf the navigation system, the um, voice alerts for that, so the actual voice that's communicating to you where you have to go next, it's not 
very good. It's quite slow. So with, I use Waze. Now this isn't a paid promotion or anything like that. Waze gives you an update, maybe like a kilometer before you have to do something and then half a mile before you have to do something and then as you, just as you have to do it. So for example, if there's a junction coming up now, it will say to me, the Tesla system communicates it to you about a kilometer out. So okay, you're looking, you're aware. But then sometimes you're kind of looking at traffic and things are going on and maybe your attention is taken away from where you need to go. So, you know, it would be helpful. Like that, for example, it's telling me of a hazard ahead. Um, but of course, that's, there are so many different users and so many different cars and I don't think the Tesla system would necessarily be able to have that. However, going back to the point I was trying to make is that this, it tells you to make the maneuver a kilometer out and then, you know, as the... Uh, maneuver is happening so like if you don't make the maneuver from the knowledge that you're given a kilometer out you're probably going to miss it in all honesty uh, but so that's why i prefer using ways and which is why i'm using ways now instead of using the setup here in terms of the positives of the car i have to say there are absolutely loads from a design standpoint it really stands out a lot of people have said they don't really like the design elements of it i have to say i really do like it it's a very open and airy space you even though it's a large car you do feel like you have very good visibility because the mirrors are positioned quite well and they're quite large uh, the rear view mirror i haven't or the rear view window i haven't really been using that much in all honesty because it's quite small um, and it's kind of obscured because the wing is up um, but i mean it, you know it's usable it's fine the uh, infotainment system it's probably the best I've ever used, I'm gonna go out and say. The reason for that is because there are no other controls, there's no other physical interfaces that you have to get to learn. Everyone in my generation, so I'm almost 30, believe it or not, and you know, about 10 years either side of that, maybe 20 years older, 30 years, you know, depending on the sort of person you are, you're going to be used to using um, touchscreen phones your day-to-day, -day, every day, you're, you know about touchscreen interfaces and you know about apps and kind of cycling through different icons and things. Yet to kind of, you don't need to learn any other sort of physical interface. You can just literally get into this, you know what you're doing straight away, very easy to use. The thing I showed you earlier about finding um, superchargers has actually blown my mind a little bit. Reason being is because usually if you're trying to look for a petrol station, yeah, you can navigate to it if you've got a good sat nav, you know, even Google Maps can do that. Use Google Maps to navigate to normal petrol stations, but then you don't know how many pumps are free and you don't know uh, the sort of quality of the pumps and how many there are in the first place and the sort of area. So, I mean, that is absolutely, it's a very simple thing. It's a very basic thing, but it's absolutely, it's so good. Because you know, like if, if there's eight pumps in total and there are four available, you can't imagine that another four Teslas are going to come in and with the one that I was charging it, which is actually at the Hilton Hotel in uh, Heathrow, you get 30 minutes free parking as well. So, I mean, you really only need 30 minutes of charging because, you know, I, you saw I got 110 miles of charging uh, from 25 minutes. And if you're doing long journeys and you're going to be using 160 miles between charges in one day, you're probably going to need a half an hour break anyway, you know, for a bathroom break, get a coffee, that kind of thing. So it works out pretty well in that respect. Everyone knows that the P100D range from Tesla has some very serious performance figures. Now, I haven't necessarily had enough time to test out the um, ludicrous mode. Uh, and I honestly haven't really had much of a desire to test it out as well. I know what a fast car feels like. And um, I really want to use this in kind of like a daily capacity. And I don't think you're going to be shooting off at 2.9 seconds to 62 in, this, in a daily capacity. You know, for fun, jolly jaunts, that sort of stuff, but not daily. The usable performance this has in chill mode or whatever it is, which is essentially the same as like comfort in most other cars, is very good. You can maintain your speed very easily. If you need to kind of dart in between traffic, get off a start, standing stop, the car has very usable performance in that respect and it doesn't feel like it's completely out of control. You feel in control of the, of the car, you feel in control of the speed. Um, one thing about that actually I have to say is that this car of course has a regenerative braking system. Now that's another benefit of an electric car or a fully electric car on a, a combustion engine car. With a combustion engine car of course what you're going to have to do is you stop, you brake uh, and you don't get anything back. You know you can't put extra petroleum into the engine from that which is why rechargeable hybrids are becoming more of a thing or a self-charging hybrid should I say. 
But with this, you get extra mileage back just from braking and stopping. But the regenerative braking, kind of self-braking system, um, is very noticeable. Now, if you're going, I think, over 50, you don't notice it too much. But if you're in the kind of daily usage speeds of about 30 to 40 miles per hour, you really feel the car slow down. Now, this is good in some ways because you're not necessarily, because I, I think it's the motors that are stopping, that are, are braking the car, so you're not necessarily wearing the brakes down by doing that. But one negative of this is that one, it reduces speed very quickly. You have to get used to it quite quickly, otherwise it can take you by surprise. And two, you're braking quite quickly, and the cars behind you, I don't think, are seeing the brake lights being applied. So they aren't actually aware of the car necessarily slowing down. Maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, once again, correct me. But as far as I'm aware, that could be a bit of an issue. I mean, you just you can decelerate from, you know, 40 to 20 in only a few seconds without actually applying the brakes. And if the brakes aren't being applied by the car autonomously, that could be quite risky if there's someone tailgating you or if there's bad weather or if it's at night. Some people wanted to see the zero to 62 time of this car. So I'm gonna try to demonstrate that. It's not in ludicrous mode, it's in completely normal mode. Um, so that is up to 60 now from a standing stop. And that's without ludicrous mode. That's in completely normal comfort chill mode. Another interesting feature about this car is that it has the autopilot because this is the P100D with ludicrous. That option has been ticked. As I showed you earlier, it's got cameras at the front, cameras at the sides. It helps the car to figure out where it is in the road in relation to the lines and the other vehicles. As I just showed you, that's what I see in the front screen. You see the car in its lane, and then you also see the proximity sensors around it, kind of telling you where things are. You don't get a picture of anything that's behind you. You only get a, the sensor array, the rear sensor and sonar arrays, telling you, okay, there is something um, that's behind the car. You have to be driving with cars in front of you to be able to actually get the proper display that I showed you. As soon as anything goes past the front kind of quarter, it displays where it is. You can see the cars in their lane, you can see cars changing lanes, and that's quite a cool feature. And that's obviously a representation of the kind of AI and the, the picture the car has generated of the road ahead. And I'm gonna try this right now, autopilot. So we have the stalk which is down here, and I think we have to pull it twice in and it says, please keep your hands on the wheel. I'm gonna keep my hands very close to the wheel. I've got my hand off of the paddle, off of the pedal below. This is very peculiar because I can feel the car accelerating. <laughs> this is very strange. Um, this is fully autonomous right now. I can feel the wheel turning in front of me. It's accelerating to keep up with the car. <laughs> it's so strange. And I think it also has a indicating function as well. So if we indicate, I think it will check. And then will it do it? Nope, it's not going to do it just yet. But I'm going to very carefully, and there's nothing there. So that's the car doing it, and that's not me doing it, that was the car. How very strange. And then the car accelerates on its own. That's so weird. This is such an odd sensation. <laughs> I've never experienced anything like this before. I'm going to try that again one more time. I'm going to try one more time. Um, it's accelerating up. I'm going to do that. And then look at that. It's, it's doing it all on its own. It's actually done that whole manoeuvre on its own. Right, I think that is more than enough that I need. So I just put your foot on the brake and you can hear that sound and that's the autopilot being disengaged. So once again, I want to say a huge thank you to EV Hire for letting me test out one of their cars. Of course, you too can hire this car and get 10% off by using Galaxy 10. Um, all of the links and the code are in the description of the video. Please subscribe for the latest content. And until next time, thanks for watching.